to try it. to make a very short introduction because Professor McCarthy asked me to make it short, but I will begin with one sentence about this water series that the Radcliffe Institute initiated, um, thinking about different aspects of this absolutely incredible multidisciplinary subject. So we will have um, maybe monthly, it depends, uh, it, sometimes two lectures per month on different aspects of water sciences, um, water and religion, water and policy, uh, water uh, technologies, water and disease. Um, so please stay tuned. Um, that is an excellent topic. You, in my opinion, one cannot find a more multidisciplinary topic that crosses all the sciences and arts and humanities and in its core. Um, today we have an excellent lecture, it's a third lecture in this lecture series, and that lecture will be given by Professor McCarthy, who is, in my opinion, one of those who would look at the big scale of water, which is water and oceanography, and Professor McCarthy um, is part of two departments here, of uh, OEB department and uh, department of environment uh, of uh, earth and planetary sciences as it's called um, and the topic of his interest is uh, oceans what happens there we'll hear about this today in the lecture so I'm not going to go into that but I want to mention to you that uh, the involvement of Professor McCarthy in this topic was really overwhelming to me to know that uh, he was a um, really a director of the for 20 years from 82 to 2002 he was a director of Harvard University Museum for uh, comparative zoology um, he was at the beginning, actually crafting the program that now is a really popular program here at Harvard that brings together um, sciences with policies, and this is the program that is called ESPP program, which is in Environmental Science and Public Policy program. So that's already his own research, is a combination between science and policy and it's what is at core things that happen at, at Harvard. Um, Professor McCarthy is, uh, is a fellow of uh, AAAS, American um, Association for Advancement in Science. He's a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He actually uh, has served as a past president and chair of the board of directors of the, of the AAAS and uh, he's a chair of the board of directors of Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, I hope you will all enjoy this lecture. Please remember that we really want to keep it for extensive discussions from any angle we can find. So I'll <laughs> now give you um, the floor uh, to, to the lecture itself, but we really hope for extensive discussion after that with different questions, whether it's from the science side or policy side or any concerned question that we may have on this topic. Well, thank you for the introduction. When I attended uh, last spring a, an organizing series for this new initiative at Radcliffe, it, it was something that I think everyone in the room thought was a great idea. But um, as I looked around, I realized that I was really the only one who seemed uh, to have interest in water that uh, had salt in it. And everybody else's interest kind of stopped as soon as it started to get salty. So when Joan asked me to uh, give a, uh, a talk this autumn and perhaps the, uh, the initial talk, I said, uh, well, I don't know how many people are interested in salty water, but um, we decided I would try and do a broad overview of the hydrological cycle. So I'm, uh, I'm not a hydrologist, I'm not a meteorologist, uh, I'm an oceanographer, but uh, one can't really study uh, the ocean without, um, without spending a lot of time trying to figure out what's happening in the atmosphere. So what I'm gonna do is sort of set the stage and talk about where water is today and uh, the role of the oceans in, in um, as a source of that water that, um, in fact, doesn't have salt in it. Uh, the salt stays behind. 
big, uh, big interesting story about the ocean, where the salt is. And um, I'm going to talk um, about um, how um, one of our major ocean cycles, and there are many climate cycles that are embedded in an ocean atmosphere interaction. And this one we know as the El Nino cycle or El Nino La Nina cycle or the Enso cycle. I hear any of those names. Uh, how that really uh, plays into um, weather on the continents, precipitation, and, and, and also temperature. And I'll be focusing uh, on some examples from the United States for that. Then I'm going to talk about, um, about frozen water, talk about what's happening in the Arctic. And then I'll come back to talk about uh, what some of the models are telling us about <clears throat> where water will be in the future, um, based on some recent past, the uh, last 50 years of trends and extrapolations uh, for climate in the future. So if we begin with um, that big piece of water that, uh, that I'm mostly interested in, the oceans, about 97.5% of the water on the planet is in the oceans. And so then you start carving away and say, well, it's only 2.5% of its fresh water. Um, Two-thirds of that is tied up in our big ice sheets, Antarctica and Greenland, are about 99% of that little alpine glaciers are minuscule. The groundwater is about 30%, frozen in ground, permafrost, maybe 1%. So the surface, fresh water, and the water in the atmosphere is four-tenths of 1% of this fraction, which is only 2.5% of this. And then we go to the next layer down and look at, we have lakes, look at, um, at, at what's in rivers, 1.6% of 0.4% of 2.5%. Um, what's in the atmosphere? You know, about 10% or in soils. And this, is, this turns out to be really important in terms of, of, um, of certainly our, our agricultural capability. Uh, see about normally 10% each uh, of 0.4% of 2.5%. So in this grand cycle, um, most of the water is in the ocean. And so what, what determines how much of that gets in the atmosphere and then what happens to that? is, of course, of enormous consequence to humans and plants and all other animals on this planet. So there are lots of cartoons. I'm not going to spend my time sort of uh, hand-waving through these things. I mean, you know the general scheme evaporates from, from the oceans. It moves to, to, to elevation. It condenses, sweeps over land. And then, of course, we have, uh, if its elevation is high enough or the season is right, we may have snow, we may have ice. And, of course, ultimately the return is to uh, flow back to the ocean. So this is, um, this is that big budget. And uh, there is more moisture, um, or excuse me, more moisture precipitating on land than there is loss through evaporation. And that's, of course, the net flow to the rivers. These units of sferdrups, this is a, a unit used for transport in, in ocean science named for uh, the, uh, the famous oceanographer, Harold Sverdrup, it's a million cubic meters per second, but here are the reservoirs and here are the fluxes, and you can see that evaporation over the, over the, over the oceans uh, is, uh, is much la is larger than precipitation because part of this ends up being precipitated on land, but if you look at precipitation over the oceans, you see that um, it's about, uh, about four times that over land. So the oceans are where most of the evaporation occurs and most of the rain occurs in the oceans as well. And if we look at um, the sort of, of terrific uh, information that's available now uh, as a result of satellites, this is from infrared. So if you look at um, a planetary view from, from polar orbiting satellites, uh, this is the amount of, of precipitable water that is held uh, within the atmosphere. And I've got two scenes here. One is January, and this just happens to be 2003. The next one is July. I'll toggle back and forth. And, of course, in January, uh, when uh, and this is um, sort of, you know, days to a month or so after the, after the winter uh, solstice, so uh, the sun is, the sun is uh, directly overhead at about the middle of, of Australia, about this latitude, you see that, that this big band across the tropical oceans is where uh, water is being evaporated. It's, uh, it's then moving uh, from the oceans over land, although we do, certainly do have significant evaporation over land that puts moisture into the atmosphere in the case of a major forest. And then if we toggle to the opposite season, we go to summer, we see that 
excuse me, northern hemisphere summer, uh, July, we see that band, of course, shifted northward. And in this case, the, uh, the Tropic of Cancer is, is uh, right about here. So this, this band moves annually over a seasonal cycle. And we see here, if we look at the uh, equatorial Pacific, which is what I, the area I'll come back to talk a fair bit about now, uh, charts like this always do tremendous disservice to the Pacific. It looks like, well, there's a little Pacific, a little Pacific, and there's the big Atlantic. And of course, the Pacific is huge. It's 42% uh, of the surface of the ocean is the surface of the Earth is the Pacific Ocean. But uh, this turns out to be an extraordinarily important area in terms of putting water vapor into the atmosphere and influencing the climate of much of South America, of North America, uh, parts of, of, of Africa, and Asia. Uh, so what happens in this band right here? And this is the one I referred to earlier for a major climate cycle. Now, this is the amount that's uh, precipitable in the atmosphere, and it's here is millimeters of, of moisture, and you see these numbers at the highest level are you know, something in excess of 50. If you actually look at how much um, precipitates on a, on, a, on a day, you'd see maximum numbers. And here, now we get the Pacific uh, the outlying continents, maybe a little hard to see here. Here's Africa, here are the Americas. Again, you see this band across the equator, heavy precipitation into the South Pacific here. Uh, into the um, into the uh, the Indian Ocean here, and this is in uh, this is in January. Um, and notice the maximum uh, values here are up in the order of 14 or so. So compared with this, you know, about a quarter of the moisture in the atmosphere in extreme um, cases is is precipitating, but the average is of course much lower than that. Now here's January. I'm going to switch to July. And, and in July, of course, um, as this band moves, moves northward, now here's the Indian subcontinent, India, Bangladesh, heavy rain. Uh, this is the monsoon. Of course, we have, we have monsoonal conditions here as well. Um, so you see this annual cycle of the ocean's warmest band uh, moving towards one pole, towards the other. That's the area where most of the evaporation occurs and then is carried by the atmosphere uh, poleward to precipitate, either in this case, uh, at pretty high latitude, southern hemisphere, 40, 50 degrees, or um, northern hemisphere. And of course, driving this ocean circulation are the winds. We have the trade winds, southeast trades, northeast trades along the equator. And then the westerlies as we move to higher latitudes in the northern hemisphere, uh, and the southern hemisphere. And then we get to the really the highest latitudes. There are easterlies, but uh, they don't play as much into this. So most of this activity is occurring uh, in, the, in the equatorial band where we have the warmest water conditions, the, the, um, uh, the, the, evaporative, um, um, the evaporative loss, the, the air rises, it moves uh, poleward, both hemispheres, it condenses and, uh, and then sinks to um, um, arrive in the Earth's surface as rain. Now, this current system, the equatorial Pacific, is, um, is a major driver that I want to spend a bit of time talking about. So, right along the equator, um, we have a current that uh, moves primarily this way, although this shows a countercurrent. It's really rather weak compared to this, another current this direction. This is actually uh, subsurface. <clears throat> we see here the uh, blue currents are the ones that bring cold water from high latitude to low latitude. So we have the California current, the blue current. The red ones are, take warm water from low latitude to high latitude. So you have the Gulf Stream, Brazil current, the Agulhas current, the Kurashio, East Australia, and so on. <clears throat> so this cycle that I'm going to refer to, the El Nino or Enso cycle, um, sets up in the Pacific Ocean. And it's a, it's a seesaw mechanism that has the ocean condition changing from one state to another, warmer or cooler. The actual driver of it is not known, um, what it is that paces it. It can occur kind of every three to seven years in its extreme form. But we know that um, if you look across the Americas, across to Asia, right in the equator, the, the Pacific Ocean uh, slopes upward as you move to the west. And the reason for that is that this current, which is pushed by 
these winds, is actually piling up water over here. So the winds weaken in this El Nino cycle. And when they weaken, the water that was piled up over here actually moves back to the east. Now, that turns out to be a, a very simplistic explanation of this. It becomes more complicated than what happens under the surface of the ocean. But if you look at this cartoon, here's the, here are the Andes and here's Indonesia. When you have the warm conditions with water piled up here, this is where most of that evaporative exchange occurs then with the atmosphere. I don't know what that is. That doesn't belong here. Um, when, when the Earth's surface, uh, when, when the ocean surface tips back the other way, then, then we have the warm water here that creates more evaporative exchange here. And you can see right away that where this rain falls is very different from where this rain falls. In this case, it's in Indonesia. In this case, it's in the Andes. And so here's a, uh, here's a cartoon of what we call the neutral phase, where we have um, this current moving along here. And because it's pulling water away from here, deep water comes to the surface. And this is a phenomenon known as upwelling. It's what makes this such an extremely rich area for marine ecosystems. It's the richest area for fish production, the largest uh, harvest of any stock of fish, the proving anchovy, about a 10% of the global harvest occurs in this area because of this upwelling, which brings nutrients and plankton production. And then uh, in this every uh, few years, the trade winds relax, the warm water flows back and disperses along the coast. It suppresses now this upwelling of, of cold water. And in the process, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, you're, you're creating a potential for moisture in the atmosphere in this area that wasn't here in this case, and also raising sea level. Now, this is one of the reasons during an El Nino, if any of you own property in Southern California, you know this is a time of year on the coast when um, property damage can, can, uh, can be severe. You have elevated... Uh, sea level, and with heavy storms, uh, this can be a time of, of concern. Notice here, and I'll come back to this later, that it also changes the circulation over North America. In this case, um, here's the polar jet moving across in this manner. But during the El Nino, notice that it um, takes a different form in this cartoon, and we'll see a little more detail on this later. So here's, a, here's another cartoon version of that. So... Here it's called normal, let's call it neutral, where we have the warm water piled up on, the, um, on the, the western Pacific. And then during the El Nino, it moves back this direction. And notice here's cool water rising to the surface. It no longer can. And then there's this other condition that is called the La Nina. So it's really an overshoot as it's returning to the neutral state and becomes exceptionally cold in this area more cool water rising than during the, the uh, uh, what we called earlier the neutral phase here. La Nina um, was named uh, only a couple of decades ago as a counterpart to El Nino, historically El Nino, the male child. Uh, this is a phenomenon that would first appear off the coast of Peru late in the calendar year or early in the calendar year. So around the Christmas period, the child and uh, this was the, uh, the origin of that name, La Nina, uh, simply conveniently the other pole of this. So this, um, this loop, and I'll talk for a few minutes as it cycles from January through to December, uh, shows sea surface temperature. We have um, Asia, Australia, the Americas here. Um, this is a tongue of warm water you see emerge and spread out this direction. And as it starts in January, you notice that um, the temperature is sort of neutral, becomes increasingly over time as we move towards the end of the calendar year uh, warm. This is the 1997-1998 El Nino um, happening over a one-year period. At the beginning of the year, the trade winds, sort of mid-year, about May, begin to relax. That's when the warm water lens is, begins to appear here. If you'd see, boom, there it is now. Well, can't look up here quickly enough, but about May. And then by the time you get to December, it's in its uh, pronounced form. Then if you were to uh, look um, at sort of the uh, January-March period, 
um, for a El Nino, uh, in this case, in 1998, uh, we would see this band of warm water. If we look 1989, the following year, we had a La Nina, and now we see uh, cooler water, the blue color in here versus the red. And plotted here are departures from long-term averages, so it would be, we talked about it as the anomaly. This is how unusually warm it was here. This is how unusually cool it was there. So January, March of 1998 in El Nino, one year later, the overshoot is it returned to the neutral phase, the La Nina. And both of these have implications for our... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, I thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's, it is just a, um, a good example of La Nina. And I'll have to check now. We can look at this next chart. Uh, there were La Ninas the last two years. I think there was also one in 1999. And now I wonder if this is actually a typo. But we'll look right here and see. So uh, this is uh, looking over time. You can't read this, but I'll try and read it. Um, this starts in 1950 and goes up to uh, 2012. <clears throat> Here's 1112. And it's showing relative to a neutral point with red on the, the numbers on top here being uh, strong El Ninos, uh, the black being, being um, moderate uh, El Ninos, the blue being strong La Ninas, and the black being moderate La Ninas. So let's look. So 19... Um, 97.98 is that strong uh, El Nino, and 98.99 is a strong La Nina. So I think that actually may be a typo in the last slide. If we go back and look at 88.89, it could have been that one, but uh, I, th I think the authors probably were intending to show one year following the other. So we have this seesaw pattern, and this kind of graph kind of dramatizes it. But um, these turn out to be really interesting years, these spikes in terms of, of weather patterns. Now, these are some of the associations that, um, that one finds with the, the sort of the, the warm episodes, uh, December through February, which would be the peak period. And then um, um, following in the, the opposite season, June through August, when this can carry on, the, the, uh, color, the colors here uh, indicate uh, a condition. So the brown or dry, uh, the green or wet, the uh, the sort of lime green is is a dry and warm. Um, the blue here is uh, wet and cool. So um, we'll look at a minute at some some uh, recent U.S. weather. But you could see that if you went from um, a a, um, a warm year like this, you would expect a particular pattern of weather to be reflected uh, from an El Nino in the uh, the the weather of the continental U.S. Um, warm up here, warm up here, uh, wet and warm down here, uh, wet and cool down here. Now, again, you see these, these effects are seen in, in Australia. They're seen in South America, uh, depending on the time of the year. They're seen in parts of Africa. And depending on whether it's a really strong event or a moderate event, they can be more, more or less strong. And these are the, 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 the uh, inverse, the La Nina patterns. And I'm not going to dwell on these for a minute because for this moment because I'm going to show you some more dramatic examples. So here's one. Sorry, this didn't show up all that well, but here's the Aleutian chain. Here is um, here would be the here would be Canada. Here would be the U.S. Again, here's the Aleutian, Aleutian chain. Here's Canada. Here's the U.S. And if we look at the difference between a an El Nino or a La Nina, we see this warm band extending down across. Um, uh, British Columbia, Southern Alaska, British Columbia, uh, the Northern States. And um, this is also a, um, a, 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 it's warm and, and rather low, um, low precipitation. So if we think of the last major El Nino, which was 2010, and um, realize what uh, some planners are going through a decade or so earlier sitting up here near Vancouver saying, okay, we're bidding on the Winter Olympics. Um, what are the conditions going to be? And they looked at the records and they thought, no matter how bad an El Nino might be, they'd be okay. Well, we know that it was a really bad El Nino, severe El Nino. And in fact, they weren't okay. 
they started the, the Olympics with very poor snow conditions. Um, if we look at a La Nina period, and uh, for the last two years we've been locked in an intense La Nina, look at the um, look at the uh, lower. You can't quite this. Here's the Gulf of Mexico here, dry, dry, uh, warm, um, wet conditions here, but here's the aridity in the American. Uh, southwest and uh, south central region that would you'd expect to be associated with a La Nina. We've had two years of severe La Nina. So um, uh, back to this graphic. Uh, this is the most recent uh, projection of the, uh, the what we call the Nino index, and you see that 11 and 12 were rising out of a a La Nina, and there's a little peak here. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a hint that we were actually moving towards a in El Nino uh, at, this, at this time. Now, uh, if you were to go to this website, which is what I do now in this next graphic, and it's actually updated uh, every Monday, and I, I had a class this afternoon, I had other things I had to do this morning, I didn't have time to go through and check the update from today, but this will be a set of about 20 uh, images of the current understanding of what's happening uh, with the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle, recent evolution, current status, and predictions. So this is the one from a week ago today, the, uh, the Climate Prediction Center of, uh, National Climate, uh, of, um, of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now, I'm going to enlarge this in just a moment. Um, this is starting in 1950. Going forward, it's a different representation of these, these um, El Nino and La Nina. So I'm going to blow up this lower panel here. So here's 1992. Here's 1998, which was... Uh, in many cases, one would argue the El Nino of the century. This was the strongest El Nino. Um, we had a uh, moderate El Nino in 2002, and El Nino has to get above this, this red line here. Here's 2010, and then here's our double dip La Nina that we've just been through. And notice this little tail again, suggesting that we're moving back towards El Nino. Now, here's the prediction made uh, one week ago for um, the next... Um, quarter, October through December, that uh, the three-month outlook uh, suggests that uh, this area, you can't read this, but uh, this is going to be above, air, above normal and long-term averages in, in, in temperature, um, this, this entire area, and this is, this is uh, more extreme than this. Um, if we look at precipitation, in this case, uh, this, is going to be, um, this is going to be particularly wet. And uh, this area will, in this forecast, be dry, which will be consistent with the development of, a, of an El Nino. If you could read the color code down here, that's what it'll tell you. And so here's our summary. So in so neutral conditions, that is, it's not out of that band yet, but you can say it's clearly an El Nino. Equatorial sea surface temperatures and many, many slides in this set that I've shown you. Near 0.5 C above average across the eastern Pacific. Atmospheric circulation over the tropical Pacific is near average, and El Nino conditions are likely to develop during September 2012. So that's, that's their forecast. This, of course, watched very closely by um, economists who are looking at futures for everything from, from corn to cocoa. Um, it, um, it's, it's looked at by uh, city planners who are concerned about infrastructure that might be stressed with a major El Nino with heavy precipitation. So I'm going to go now to this larger picture of the change in Earth's temperature over the last um, 100 and some years and talk a bit about some of the noise in this record. So this is uh, the product of the World Meteorological Organization, which uses uh, three compilations of global temperature, one put together by the British Met Office, the Hadley Center, uh, one by our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and one by NASA. And if you look over time, you see that um, the, there are three colors here. You can't necessarily see they're different, but they, they, um, they agree quite well. The gray is the uncertainty about them, and you see that over time the the gray has become smaller. There's quite a bit of range here. Um, but, uh, but basically, here's our 1998 um, strong signal. That's interesting. That was an El Nino. Here's 2010. That's interesting. Another big spike. Um, 
People have looked at this and, um, as we'll see in a little bit, um, concluded that this rise is, um, is explained best by the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Can't be explained by solar variability. Can't be explained by any internal cycle. Um, it um, is, of course, a, a, a strong part of the projections we'll show later for future climate. And if you um, were to assume that this is a global condition, that the atmosphere is warming, so we should see indications other places, what would you expect? Well, um, if the land surface, and I should have said these are a compilation of, this is global average surface, this is land and ocean, that uh, the sea surface temperature is increasing, land surface temperature is increasing. What else would you expect? Well, you'd expect greater humidity, and we're seeing that. You expect a loss of sea ice, a little more about that later. You'd expect a loss of glaciers, uh, that's occurring. You'd expect less snow cover. You'd expect sea level to rise, we'll see a bit of that in a moment. And um, if you um, were to question how we know about that the, for the ocean, this is a remarkable accomplishment over the last uh, decade. Um, an observing system now that has uh, over 3,500 drifting floats. The colors here represent different nations that are partners in this, that are profiling the ocean down to 2,000 meters, sending the signal back via satellite to data centers. And as a result of that, uh, we know what ocean heat content looks like. This is the ocean heat content zero to 2,000 meters. Uh, here is the implementation of that new system of buoys. And notice the little whiskers, which are the air bar. This is heat content increasing 2000, 2010. And whereas you might look at this and say, hmm, this looks pretty noisy. As we look at this, if we look at the ocean heat content, it's a pretty clear signal that the oceans are warming steadily uh, and are integrating this in a way that the atmosphere isn't. So that's one of the reasons the atmosphere looks noisy. But what about that noisy record? So here's something the World Meteorological Organization does every year. They plot the warmest years, the 50 warmest years, the last 150. They uh, color bin them. And so uh, there is, uh, there's a color here that's uh, sort of out of uh, bounds, and that's uh, 2011, which is right here, because this only goes to 2010. It shows up looking like the same color here, but this should be a different color. So 2000 to 2010 are this rust color. The more butterscotch color are 1990, 1990s. Uh, the yellow color are the 70s and the 80s. The green color are the 50s and the, uh, the 60s. And the blue color are the, the 30s and the 40s. So if you were to go through and say, well, in a band, like here are the, here are the rust ones, uh, which are the highest? Well, here's 2010, still the warmest year in record is 2005. Um, then we have 2003. The asterisks here mean that they're El Nino years. Um, let's look at the butterscotch ones. Which are the warmest? This one, this one, and this one. Uh, three top years are El Nino years. Let's look at the uh, 70s and 80s. The, uh, the lemon color, the three warmest years are El Nino years, and so on. So this tells you that a lot of that, that noise that you're seeing in the record from year to year is really due primarily to this one very strong cycle. Now, there are other strong climate cycles. There's something um, that occurs in the North Atlantic, the North Atlantic Oscillation. There's a Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Many of these are multiple decade. Uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and many of them would, would have a signal in here as well, but the really strong signal is, um, is with the El Ninos. Now let's jump to the Arctic. Um, a lot of news about the Arctic in the last couple of months. Uh, this is um, from uh, September 22nd. The white area is the area of sea ice in the Arctic. This, um, this uh, pink line is the average sea ice extent from 1979 to 2000. The data start in 1979 because that's when the satellite observations that can give us high-resolution um, data for the Arctic begin. 
Before that, there are other data, and they're consistent with this, but we focus on this record beginning a little over 30 years ago. So what we see this summer is a new record for the extent of minimal extent of Arctic ice. Uh, this shows the, the, uh, the percent of uh, decline uh, for August values. Um, and so what we're, we're seeing, this only goes to August 2010. And we're seeing uh, this steady decline. Um, if we look at the, the, um, the seasonality of ice from June through October, uh, this line is the average, again, from 1979 to 2000. The previous record year was 2007, which is here, the area of ice, and here's uh, 2012, which uh, substantially less than 2007. So this is an area where climate models have really failed. Um, climate models would not have predicted that ice would be lost as rapidly as it's being lost. It's a very complex relationship. If you think of, of the water under the ice, it's obviously warmer than the ice. It's liquid. Okay? The ice provides a layer of insulation, the exchange of, of heat, but also moisture. So once the ice is gone, you now have the evaporative loss. You have, you have wind, you have mixing. You have mixing of that surface water with deeper water. There's actually uh, an interesting layer in, in the Arctic with salt and with temperature. Um, with ice loss in the Arctic, um, it has the potential to, to change the climate, not only the Arctic, but the North Atlantic in ways that we don't fully understand because the North Atlantic really penetrates into the Arctic Ocean uh, the Arctic Ocean is like a cul-de-sac of the North Atlantic. There's very little exchange with the Pacific because that's shallow through the Bering Strait, the Bering Shelf. So this, um, this is a, um, a particularly uh, unnerving uh, result. When we saw 2007 here, we thought, well, um, uh, thank goodness, look at what happened the following year. It bounced back up. Hopefully you won't here, be here again for decades. But here we are a few years later. Um, at an even lower ice uh, extent. Now, um, these next couple of slides are strictly anecdotal. Um, the other thing that's happening is the ice is getting thinner. So this is a, um, a Russian icebreaker, 75,000 horsepower nuclear icebreaker. There's this wonderful mouth painted on the front. Uh, these little windows up here are about uh, one meter high. This crack, I'm in a small helicopter photographing this. The crack is, um, is being caused by the brute force of this machine. The thickness of this ice, you can see these dots are about a, they'd be about a meter, or like you know, four meters thick. This would have been very typical in the early 90s in the central Arctic. So a decade later, this is within 50 miles of the North Pole. It's actually the same ship. They... Um, they have since painted the mouth back on, I'm happy to say, but it was off in this period. Look at the thickness of the ice here. You can see that it's uh, maybe half the, thick, half the height of the windows here. And this is a, a satellite product which shows um, ice thickness in the Arctic, 1985 to 2000. So here's the Canadian archipelago. Here's Greenland. Um, here's Svalbard. This is Franz Joseph Land. And here, and this is, this is wintertime now, um, northern hemisphere winter, this is February, uh, when you would have ice at its maximum extent. And the color here indicates uh, the age of the ice, but, but also its thickness. So the young ice maximum is about a meter. Uh, the old ice um, can be three, four meters. So here's the oldest ice, six-year-old ice. Look how little there is here. Look at the one-year ice here. Look at it here. So if you think of these slides I just showed, we went from Franz Josef Land to the North Pole, which is here. You can see that in the 1980s um, to 2000, uh, you could have easily been in two, three, four, five, six year ice. Whereas here, from Franz Josef Land to the North Pole, you might be lucky to hit um, at two year ice. But you say uh, one year ice, does that mean it was entirely clear so, and then refrozen? Right. So uh, remember that uh, this is, this is uh, in February. So the Arctic Ocean will be completely covered with ice. And then in the summer, it's shrinking to something like this. So this area, now in winter, this will be completely filled with 
new ice all the way down here, to here actually, right to here, up off here, completely filled with new ice. That would be your one-year ice. So your uh, recent paper, uh, 2012 paper, trying to model some of this, and I, I, I'm not going to go into any detail here other than to say, uh, really looking at ice thickness here, and, and here's time, 1980, and, um, and trying to understand, uh, this is uh, different uh, estimates of rates of change, uh, what the projections might be for the future. And as you can see, uh, the slope of this uh, through the last, uh, um, from mid-90s to uh, uh, 2000s is, is really uh, extremely steep. Now, one of the interesting things is you think, well, that's going to change things in the Arctic, but we know it's also going to change things uh, where we are too. And increasingly, you're seeing papers now, uh, this is one published uh, two years ago, large-scale atmospheric circulation changes associated with recent loss of Arctic ice, and talks about the implications of this for moisture and um, for temperature over the adjacent uh, temperate latitudes. So the longer you have the Arctic ice free, through the summer, the larger the area and the longer that period, the more potential to put moisture then into the atmosphere that can be uh, distributed um, further south to, to uh, over parts of Canada or the U.S. And, of course, we know, uh, like the lake effect, uh, if, you have, if you have a lake without ice in the winter, you tend to think, well, it's winter, would you have much evaporation? You do have a lot of evaporation in the winter. You have dry air. So you can evaporate moisture from the lake, look at, uh, look at the area, like uh, think of Oswego County in New York that's had record snows in recent years. The longer Lake Erie is ice-free, the more moisture you have to create that snow condition in winter. What limits snow in an area like this in winter is, uh, is not moisture, or excuse me, not temperature, it's moisture. Okay, it can be cold enough to snow, but you don't have moisture. So our moisture here typically comes up from the Gulf or our nor'easters. And so you have a dry air mass moving across the continent south of here, low pressure cell, it has no moisture left, it's already lost that over land, it's over the ocean, picks up moisture, spins around and brings us from the northeast vector then the moisture that creates our winter storms or our, our serious blizzards. We can also get moisture that comes up in the Gulf of Mexico, those storms that come up along the mid-Atlantic states. So this time of year we're just now seeing that switch where the ocean in our coastal waters uh, is starting to lose heat rather than gain heat. The shorter days, lower sun angle, cooler conditions. Um, but about <laughs> half of the heat in our area here that the ocean loses the atmosphere is from evaporation. So the evaporative loss, as moisture goes in the atmosphere, uh, heat is released just as you know our skin feels cool coming out of the, out of the shower as the evaporation uh, takes that moisture from liquid to vapor, and, and heat goes with it. So the other place in the Arctic where we're seeing um, unpleasant surprises are Greenland. So Greenland uh, is covered by a, a sheet of ice that um, is actually sufficiently thick. It rises to about 3,200 meters here to depress the center of Greenland below sea level. And although this has been uh, in the news a fair bit, um, and you will find it in all kinds of news, you'll find it uh, in news that says uh, there are alarming changes taking place on Greenland, and then you'll find it in news that says, no, 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 Greenland is fine, that uh, it's, it's gaining ice in the middle. Well, that's true, but it's, it's losing, ice, losing ice faster than it's gaining it. Uh, the blue areas here are where uh, it's thinning most, most dramatically. Um, there are actually uh, some faint, it's hard to show up in this image, but some faint areas where it's actually thickening. But by and large, you can see along the edges, we're losing, losing ice on, on Greenland. Now, uh, if you um, look at uh, this from uh, summer, um, most, just recently in July, there were four days in July when an extraordinary thing happened in Greenland. This shows the surface of Greenland uh, that was above the freezing point of, of water, where it's red. And 
And, and, and this is a condition that if you go back 20 years, this would have been a very small amount, little fringes here. And this has grown with time as the earth has warmed in the last 20 years. And, and over a four day period this summer, it shot to a point that hadn't been seen in the satellite record before of the entire surface of Greenland now above the a temperature above the melting point of water. So that means that, that surface water is forming at pools. Maybe you've seen photographs of these, these uh, sapphire blue melt pools that, that form in the surface of Greenland. We went back and looked at ice records and thought, you know, there may be evidence of this happening in, uh, once in the, in the late 1880s. It's also interesting, a period of intense El Ninos, the late 1880s. But uh, this, this uh, sent alarm bells um, that uh, caused us uh, pause. Now, as we look forward, um, as I said earlier, we know that the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and this is, um, uh, these are data for carbon dioxide. Um, specifically, these are the direct measurements from, from uh, atmospheric sampling uh, done globally now, but initially at Mauna Loa in the, in the late 50s. These are data from, from ice cores in Antarctica. No matter where you go, you can construct this ice core record. And of course, it goes back in time, um, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years. But you see they, they seamlessly come together here. And of course, um, if this is uh, the major cause of these changes and you project a future that has this going up, then then uh, you can make projections about temperature. And that's is what the IPCC and other groups have done, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So uh, this is year 2000. Here's uh, the scales change. So here's the recent history. And then a family of curves going forward. Um, this is one that would say, well, we've just managed magically to cap all emissions. So uh, this is temperature. It would flatten out. If we do nothing about emissions, um, we're, on, um, we're on this upper trajectory here. And of course, various pathways could have us doing something different. But this is what we call business as usual for all intents and purposes, sort of rocketing ahead as if there were no concern. And of course, if you reach any of this sort of midpoint area, the temperature would be comparable to what was last seen on the planet um, order 25, 35 million years ago. And when, when we had that temperature, sea level was higher by uh, 20 to 30 meters. So say, well, it's been warmer in the past, but also we haven't had um, cities sitting basically a meter or so uh, above sea level, like Boston. So um, I, I'm skipping over the, uh, the exercise that is routinely used to show the addition of all the different factors that are either contributing to warming or offsetting warming and the inventory of those and what gives scientists confidence when they say most of the warming in the last 50 years is coming from greenhouse gases. If anyone's interested in talking about that later, I can, I can show more of that. And of course, here's a simple relationship between um, the water vapor that can be held um, by atmosphere with, uh, as a function of temperature. As temperature goes up, water vapor goes up. Now, if we look at um, the last 50 years, this is from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, um, this shows um, change that's occurred over the last half century um, as percent of diminished precipitation. So the brown areas are areas where it has gotten drier over the last 50 years. The blue areas are areas where it's gotten wetter. The neutral colors are, are uh, these light shades here. So um, we have reason to believe that um, that Changes have already occurred in some areas as a result of, of warmer conditions. And one of the things that scientists look at is, um, well, uh, if we're breaking warm records and cold records at about an equal rate, or wet records and dry records about an equal rate, is anything changing? Maybe not. But if you start to break records that are warmer more frequently than cold, and wetter or drier, depending on your location, then um, maybe things are changing. This is a slide put together uh, by Chris Field this past summer based on Jerry Meal's work. And this is looking at, at temperature. So, uh, and this is for the, uh, for the US using US weather records. So in the 50s and through the 60s, uh, about 50-50, record highs or record lows. 70s, 80s, about the same. Then we shift the 90s, 2000s. We see it starts to shift. Here's 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. 
Now you don't want to lean too much on one month, but you can see this, this uh, trend um, for the recent past of showing, uh, which is, you know, you only have to read the newspaper to see, oh, new record, how many days over 100 degrees in succession, or how many days uh, succession without rain to realize that uh, we're moving into uh, a very, very different uh, climate space. Now, the, uh, the U.S. Global Change Research Program has made projections about um, what would happen to precipitation as, um, as we move forward with um, one of those intermediate uh, climate scenarios. So uh, here's winter, spring, summer, fall, and let's just look at summer. And so this is um, showing increased dryness with the brown colors in summer uh, as we move into a warmer world, in this case, towards the end of the century, 2080, 2099, and, uh, and wetter in, um, in, in all seasons, and particularly in winter um, at high latitude. And, and how much of this will be snow? How much will be rain? Of course, depends on, on uh, temperature. But you see this pattern where the lower part of North America will become uh, more dry, uh, the northern uh, part will become more wet. Uh, here's here from the same study, the uh, U.S. Global Change Research Study, um, and looking at, at projected runoff. Uh, and this is the American Southwest, um, and this is um, minus 40% relative to, to uh, climatology, more runoff here and less here. So this whole area becoming increasingly arid, um, to some lesser degree here, this area become wetter. And if you look at uh, you look at storms, uh, precipitation events, you see that already uh, there is a record of this area increasing in in uh, precipitation. I'd like to turn for a few minutes to look at a recent study from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Extreme Events, and I'll just give you this little lexicon. Um, I'm not going to uh, there won't be a quiz on this, but. Um, <laughs> The IPCC uses um, terminology to describe likelihood. So you will see, uh, you'll see likely, very likely, and virtually certain in these upcoming graphics. And so likely is, you know, uh, kind of two-thirds to 100% probability, very likely, 90 to 100, virtually certain, 99 to 100. Um, now, th this is, let's just ask you, you just squint at this to get the, the picture. These are consecutive dry days. Um, and this is soil moisture, okay? So consecutive dry days um, for the mid part of the century, 2040s through 2060s, the, the, um, uh, the reds and yellows are increasing dryness. So again, you see this pattern, increasing dryness. Uh, the green are, are becoming wetter. And you get to the end of the century, you just see it more extreme. Soil moisture, which is, of course, extremely important for agriculture, you know, a, a large portion of our, of our agriculture is not irrigated. Uh, in this case, um, uh, dryness becomes negative because more dry as you go red, and um, it becomes, um, I'm sorry, yeah, soil moisture becomes more moist as you go green. You see that there are not a lot of areas that are out here in the, in the green or blue. Most areas become drier and some a lot drier. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to blow up just a couple of panels from this. Um, this is a global uh, mapping of, uh, of return periods for a precipitation event that would occur kind of every 20 years, so five times a century. So you say this is the 20-year storm. And I'm going to blow up two areas here. And so this is North America. And, and it's using mid-century and then end of century in three different climate scenarios, the red being the most extreme one. And so the, the precipitation event, well, let's just go to, to uh, eastern North America. The precipitation event that climatologically would have been the one in 20-year in storm, as you can see, uh, by mid-century would be less than that, between, between 10 and 15 years by the end of the century at the schedule. It would be the 7-year you know, uh, to 10-year to event. And if you start to look at 100-scale, 100 100-year, 100 century-scale precipitation, those are the ones that bring us enormous coastal flooding, um, that, that also plays in this. They couldn't do it with the same resolution over the globe. If we look at another area across uh, 
uh, much of, of um, Central and, and uh, Northeastern Asia, you see again uh, this, this same pattern. So what it says is that, that as the warmer Earth, uh, more moisture, we're going to have, we have more energy with that evaporation. We have more intense precipitation. So, so intense storms are going to become more frequent. Now, if the soil is also drier, you, know, you reach a point where um, that water will not be efficiently absorbed. It will run off rather than, than be retained. So these next two slides are just summary statements. And this is, we come back to the virtually certain and likely terminology, extreme events. So this is from the most recent report. Model, models project substantial warming in, in temperature extremes by the end of the 21st century, virtually certain increases in the frequency magnitude of warm daily temperatures extremes and decreases in cold extremes occur during this 21st century globally. It is likely the frequency of heavy precipitation in proportion to total rainfall, heavy rainfalls will increase, particularly the case in high latitudes and tropical regions. Continuing, average tropical cyclone maximum wind speed, so cyclone, tropical cyclones are hurricanes or typhoons, likely to increase, although increases may not occur in all ocean basins. Likely a global frequency of tropical cyclones either decrease or remain unchanged. And of course, only a small fraction of those tropical cyclones really hit land. You know, you remember, well, yeah, uh, the hurricanes, we remember, you know, if it's got a K, Katrina, what about all the ones before Katrina? Well, they dissipated at sea. Um, maybe, I don't remember, maybe in one before Katrina that year, but it hit land. But, but, but the, the actual number of hurricanes or, or um or typhoons, which are both tropical cyclones, uh, is not the issue here. It's whether it'll be more intense. Medium confidence, there'll be a reduction in the number of extra tropical cyclones. Medium confidence that droughts will intensify in the 21st century in some seasons and areas to reduce precipitation and or increase evapotranspiration. Okay, just a couple of final slides on sea level rise then. <clears throat> as you know, as the, as the ocean warms, it expands, so the sea level rises. Um, ice melts. That liquid water goes from ice on land to, to the ocean, not sea ice, but land ice. And of course, land can be moving up and down with substance or uplift, uh, so local sea level can vary. And here's another extraordinary success of the satellite record. So the red data here are satellite measurements for sea level rise. Before that, they're tide gauge. And, and what you see is that sea level rise right now is about three times uh, what it was uh, at the beginning of this last century. So something in order about a millimeter a year up to something more like three. And if we look at the best projections um, that uh, come out of recent models, it says by the end of the century, it, it could be something um, between uh, one or two meters. And that's a result of warming the ocean and, and ice loss. And, and to put that in context, and again, big errors on past sort of sea level, but this is, this is the, the recent period of showing how steep that rise is compared to what we've seen over the last thousand years. Of course, 18,000 years ago, when we had a big block of ice sitting right here, sea level was 100 or so meters uh, lower, but we came out of that over, over a few thousand years. Over the last thousand years, sea level gradually increased and then recently has popped up. Now, another really important thing about sea level rise is it is not uniform. We think sea level, sea level, but some areas sea level is rising faster than others. And it has to do with, with temperature conditions, also has to do with currents, has to do with the intensity of currents. And this, this shows, this graph shows areas in red, which are, are from the, the last half century, showing the greatest rate of sea level rise. And uh, you see this area here. I'm going to uh, show a gripping graphic, um, this next slide, which is a, a, a very um, wonderful little notion put forth uh, by Murray and B. Mumbro uh, a couple of years ago about what Boston might do with a meter of sea level rise. And, uh, you know, so here's Thompson Island, <laughs> Spectacle Island. You could connect them across. You could make uh, docks or um, um, uh, the locks here, rather, um, put a tunnel under this. So um, people are thinking about these things. Um, Atlantic City, you can't do this. Manhattan, you can't do this. But uh, people are thinking about these things. 
So um, I'm going to end here. Um, happy to take questions. I hope I've given you a sense of, um, of how uh, the oceans connect to, to climate on land, and particularly with regard to this very powerful cycle we know as the El Nino or Enso cycle, and how the changes that are underway right now, <clears throat> uh, we don't know <clears throat> to what degree they will change these cycles, but we know they're changing the, the background upon which these, these oscillations will occur. So a couple of years of intense La Nina uh, 50 years ago would not have had the same effect on the American Southwest as they did in the last couple of years. And going forward, these natural cycles superimposed upon a warmer, uh, wetter or drier a continental area uh, will create even, even larger extremes. So I'll end at that point. Thank you. Shall love or take <coughs> one, one thing you didn't mention. Uh, the Only one. The ocean conveyor belt and the saltiness of the ocean. I was wondering if you could just add a little bit about those implications of those two things. So the, the question is about uh, what we call the ocean um, conveyor belt. Um, so if we look at... Um, Look at this Gulf Stream going uh, northward. Um, it's not really pushing northward. It's being pulled northward because of water that sinks in this area. So this water is cold because it's at high latitude and it's also deep. If we move across the comparable latitude in the Pacific, we're moving into the Bering Sea and don't have that deep water. But this is also an area of, of sea ice formation. So as the ice is formed, it leaves salt behind. So the adjacent water is um, very cold. It's cold as it can get without freezing. And salt has been added to it, which of course depresses the freezing point. And this dense water then sinks. And it must be replaced, so it's pulling. It's pulling this water northward. And the North Atlantic Drift, which is extends to the Gulf Stream, comes all the way up here over here. This is where Murmansk is. That's why this was the, the Russian um, port they could always gain access to in the winter with minimal ice problem. Uh, this circulation then, then moves southward, branches, comes down, cross, joins comparable deep water here. This is called North Atlantic um, bottom water. Um, it then ends up up in the North Pacific. This takes kind of a century. So, so this this affects, it moderates the climate of this area because of the, if you look off the coast of Norway, it moved over to comparable latitudes here. It's much more moderate. Um, so to what degree is the warming, um, the, the diminished formation of sea ice going to contribute to slowing this? And it's something that's in all the models. Um, it's in that category of um, we don't know this well enough to be really confident the low probability, high consequence um, tipping of, of climate. Uh, there's evidence that that did happen in the past. So it's, it's always in the thinking of, of a possible future, but it's not something that's thought to be, you wouldn't find it in the likely category in an IPCC projection. Good enough? Well, I was just wondering, is there any research that shows that you that changes? Uh, it, it, it is a research showing changes. Um, you know, it's something that's, that's being researched uh, very aggressively um, that uh, the, to, to set up a uh, sort of consistent time series observations in this area to, to, to actually be able to detect these changes. But we don't have the history of observations that allow you to see small changes here the way we do now for ocean heat content. Why does the ENSO cycle change global temperature rather than just move it around? So why does ENSO cycle change global temperature rather than move it around? Well, um, you've, you have a period of um, a year, maybe, um, maybe a quarter of a year, in which you no longer have that cold water coming to the surface. So the, the result is this, the area that would normally in the neutral phase, be, be, um, have cooler water, now has warmer water. And, and that just raises the average temperature then uh, for the globe. I, I didn't show you, but if, we, if you looked at the North Atlantic, you see that it's also warmer. It's one of the, the area that is, is um, 
suitable for the formation of tropical storms. Uh, uh, frontogenesis, the, the formation of tropical depression, tropical storms in the, in the uh, tropical Atlantic is actually larger during that period as well. So it's primarily in the Pacific, but you do see global patterns as a result of just a smaller area of the Pacific being cool with the suppressed upwelling. Yes. You said you didn't pull down. Oh, sorry. Because it's recording. All right. Uh, you said that the causes of the El Nino cycle aren't known, but what are the hypothesized drivers of the El Nino cycle? Well, isn't the I mean causes drivers? Um, it's it's really once it tips, and and you can we can look through a lot of slides. You'll see that there'll be a and it's. It has to do with, with uh, the propagation of, of waves across the Pacific, uh, something called Kelvin waves. You end up seeing a, a, a pause in those trade winds, and then, and then and you'll see a little burst of, of wind moving the other direction, and then it relax, then maybe another one, and then another one, and then finally sufficiently sustained to, to actually begin the movement of water the other direction. And so it's, it's a tension that's always there, and sometimes it just sort of becomes unstable and flips. Uh, there are uh, people who study this and write very theoretical papers about it, could probably give you a couple hours lecture on it, but there isn't a good sort of simple hand-waving explanation for why an El Nino would occur at a particular moment or a particular year and not another. And when we talk about predictions of El Ninos, really what we're doing is recognizing the early signs of them. Um, this, this was not possible until about the 1970s when we had enough buoys out in the Pacific Ocean to begin to see the temperature was, was, was looking unusually warm. And then the, the really forecast, not predictions, we talk about them as predictions, would say, hmm, this is now starting to look like the setup of an El Nino. But there is no capacity to predict that there will be one two years from now or, or even one year from now. It's, it's uh, literally months ahead and, and at the earliest kind of April, May for the following year. Sorry, that's not a, not a thorough answer, but I, there, there isn't a, a simple one. Yes? Will the tropics, will they get more rain than the present rainfall? The yeah. tropical areas, is, it project, is there any projection? The, the tropics, yes. Most of the, most of the um, most evaporation is in the tropics, and most of the precipitation is in the tropics. That's what those early couple of slides showed. Okay. How about the Antarctic? Is the ice thinning? <laughs> so, so Antarctica. If we looked at any of these, uh, let's see. Maybe we could look at. Yeah. How about this one? So um, this is uh, precipitable water. And, and one of the things, if you um, think about ice and snow, would notice is that um, get to Antarctica, there's very little precipitable water. Uh, there's a little more up here. The reason for that is that you can move from temperate latitudes uh, without a lot of, of, of elevation. You know, this is, there's no, no obstruction here, um, you know, in around a few mountains here, but a lot of low lying. And of course, once you get to the Arctic, uh, it's it's low lying land. The Antarctic, um, you have um, you have this annulus of uninterrupted wind blowing around the Antarctic. It's kind of constricted here uh, between the Antarctic Peninsula and South America, Drake Passage. But otherwise, it's this uh, it's this um, annulus of wind that that is um, moving around the continent. And of course, if you want to uh, have snow in Antarctica, you got to get moisture from here to here. So it's, uh, it's got to be more of a diffusive process. You don't have transport onto, onto land the way you do here with the westerlies bringing, bringing uh, moisture across here that could, uh, could precipitate across North America and Greenland. Antarctica is um, it's the coldest continent. Um, it's also the driest continent. It um, has the highest average elevation of the continent, and that's ice. So the rate of accumulation of ice in Antarctica is actually very, very low. It's um, by any, any definition of the word, a desert. 
How old, how old is the um, oldest ice that actually was melting? I mean, we saw the sea ice, which is only six years maximum, uh, but isn't there on the Greenland on Greenland um, ice, which is much older than, uh, than I mean, we, uh, and how, how old is the ice that's uh, the oldest ice that's actually melting? So uh, the, the ice on Greenland is, um, again, maximum depth is a little over 3,000 meters. And, um, and I actually don't know what the oldest ice is, but um, it's at least 20,000 years. Okay. In Antarctica, um, there's ice that is multiples of that. The, um, there's ice at the Vostok core, which is about 450,000 years old. Now, you ask about the oldest ice that's melted? That's, that's, yeah. yeah. The oldest ice that's actually... So, so the, the answer to that is actually in the Andes, where tropical glaciers that were cored um, in the... In the, um, in the 1980s, ice cores that were made in those glaciers to, to look at the history of climate in that area, there, there is at least one of those glaciers that uh, today, I mean, they're all, they're all shrinking, but today has completely lost that record. That is, surface melt uh, percolating down through the ice has, has smeared the record. Yeah. Now, there's a, a kind of a, if, if this were a trick question that you had asked me, there would be a trick answer. Um, Probably the oldest ice that's melted is actually in the center of Antarctica. So the Vostok ice core, and some of you may have read about this, the, 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 this is the Russian, um, the Russian ice core that first gave us a reconstruction of, of uh, averse climate with any sort of precision uh, back for uh, the last 150,000 years, um, analyzed by, by um, French scientists through the 1980s into the 1990s. They uh, continued to drill um, past that 150,000 year cycle, got back to 400 some thousand years. And then as they were looking each year, they'd drill, come home, look at the ice, drill, come home, look at the ice. Here was a signal, I'm just zigzagging to show you an example of signal. And they reached a point where the signal was now um, uniform with depth and it was the average of what was above, which meant that ice had at some point melted and refrozen, and then it dawned on them that there could be water under this, and so that's what's been in the news in the last couple of years is actually punching into Lake Vostok, which is a, which is liquid water sitting under 3,000 meters of ice in the center of Antarctica. So you've got the pressure of the ice, but you also have the insulation of the ice, and so just the release of heat from Earth over hundreds of thousands of years has, has allowed the surface of the bedrock there to be warm enough to melt the ice. So that would be the, the trick question, trick answer. Um, the oldest ice on the planet has probably melted. But we know that ice that um, a few decades ago was tens of thousands of years old um, has now been changed as a result of melting. One of your slides showed the Atlantic Ocean off the U.S. East Coast having a higher than average uh, rate of rise. And I was uh, wondering, is there any information as to how long that uh, above average rise rate could last? Uh, you know, that's a great question, and um, it's a very active sort of research area right now to understand the, um, uh, the spatial pattern in, um, in this, sort of, this sort of information. So... <clears throat> uh, the conditions, as I mentioned, one that would give rise to this would be if, if it were warmer than surrounding waters. <clears throat> Another is an intensification of the Gulf Stream, and I don't know if there's any evidence of that, but that, that would also do this, okay? Would bring, bring water in here. And of course, th these are, um, th this is, you know, data that's averaged over, over 50 years. And if you looked at, at shorter periods of time, if you looked at the last decade or year-to-year uh, -year variation, there'd be a whole other pattern here. So this is just a demonstration that that it, it, you shouldn't be complacent in thinking, oh, okay, sea level is going to rise this amount, and I'm okay. Uh, in fact, um, it could be that you're at a place where it could be rising faster. The other thing is changing, and while you'd look at this and say, well, this doesn't look too bad in here, but 
but many of these um, uh, island nations that have been in the news, um, you'd say, oh, gee, and here, my, they, they, they could be lucky here, uh, are seeing um, higher, um, higher storm surge. So uh, the intensification of storms over the ocean, um, although you'd say, well, the, the mean sea level uh, has not risen all that much, that the, the, the storm surge or the height of waves with, um, with typical storms in some areas is increasing. So that's another factor that adds the, to the calculation about where you want to be when sea level rises. One of the counterintuitive things to me is the plasticity of the earth or the elasticity of it. And the middle of Greenland is below sea level. Is that going to come up much when the um, ice melts? And will the converse also happen in the seas where the bottoms of the ocean will go down? That is relative to the center of the earth as they have more weight on top of them. Well, that little bit of um, weight from Greenland is <laughs> kind of a small addition to this. But, yeah, so if you look at, uh, you know, 18,000 years ago when the Laurentide ice sheet uh, came down across this whole area uh, south of here and, of course, retreated and left that rubble that we call Martha's Vineyard in Long Island. And um, the, the, um, uh, the land area all north of here is, is still actually rising as a result of that. The same on the, the Scandinavian Peninsula. So it's called isostatic rebound. It still hasn't yet reached its neutral point. The comment earlier about uh, there having been a time when this we know that uh, this North Atlantic circulation shut down is related to that because the ice retreated and left a big depressed area in the middle of this um, of this region of Canada um, and filled with water. So the ice is gone, but ice is still melting north of there. It filled this up, um, actually known as Lake Agassiz. Um, it, uh, it at one point then uh, burst a path that became, it's really through the St. Lawrence now, that, that drained this fresh water uh, thought rather abruptly um, order 12,000 years ago into the North Atlantic. And this lens of fresh water then over the North Atlantic uh, shut down this, this uh, deep, deep uh, convective circulation, the, the conveyor. So, so that area was sufficiently depressed to actually pool water um, it's, it's, of course, then slowly rebounding, but it reached a point where the perimeter was not stable and, and burst this, uh, this exit uh, east. But, uh, yeah, Greenland, you look at, uh, I don't have the graphic here, but the center of Greenland is uh, depressed. I don't know what the depth is, probably, you know, tens of meters uh, below sea level. And when uh, Antarctica, it turns out, uh, we talk about East Antarctica and West Antarctica. West Antarctica is, is a solid plate, but East Antarctica is several small units that are now covered by ice, small units of land, and, and there are uh, big sort of valleys between some of them, which are also filled with water, which wasn't known 20 years ago. But now we know there, there are actually lakes under a fair bit of the ice in Antarctica. You mentioned that sun cycles seem not to have anything to do with uh, all these graphs. Uh, is there any contribution at all? Uh, because uh, all the graphs uh, were spiking up. Uh, so what does the sun do? So what does the sun do? The, the, sun, um, the sun has a, a cycle that uh, we know best on the sort of the 11-year period. Um, Owen Gingrich left. He could talk to us about that. Um, the, um, we have just, um, in the last couple of years, moved out of a kind of a protracted solar minimum. We've only known precisely what that variation is in terms of the amount of radiant energy reaching the Earth since that same number I've said many times, 1980, because satellites were launched that could actually measure it. Uh, sitting on the surface of the Earth, trying to measure the amount of energy from the sun, you've got clouds, you've got haze, and over a period of a day, you can't, you can't get a a measurement that without interference and we're, we're just very very lucky to find such a day um, so um, that variation is about plus or minus uh, two tenths of a watt per square meter the amount of insulation that we packed into the atmosphere with greenhouse gases is more like two watts per square meter so at one point the the, the solar cycle would have uh, been more likely to be evident in in climate patterns, but now it's, it's, it's being swamped 
by this larger signal. Although there are some, there was a paper just appeared in the scientific literature uh, in, the, in the last couple of months about the possibility of coupling of the El Nino cycle and the solar minimum that could explain some of the weather that, that Europe experienced in the last couple of years. So it, it's, uh, it's always disturbing when uh, people want to pick away at the, at the uh, robust nature of climate science by saying, well, they ignore natural cycles. The natural cycles are all in there. Um, some of them we know better than others. The solar cycle, you can go back in time before this record using uh, proxies like beryllium-10 or C14. Uh, C14 is formed in the atmosphere as a function of, of incoming gamma rays. So the notion that, that, uh, that these uh, don't play a part in all the projections, they certainly do, but they're a smaller and smaller component of the overall picture. Uh, let's take the last question so that we can finish the, the common session um, by, uh, by, uh, by 6.30 and maybe other questions if Jim wants to answer them more after that. So let's take the last okay. question. And before we do that, just to remind you that we still have water lectures. The next one will be about water and disease, in particular water and cholera. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all these results and analysis of this data. Now, I'm wondering what do we do with this? So, uh, for me, it sounds pretty alarming. Uh, you sound very neutral. What is your advice? What, what Do we have to change this um, thing? What can we do? Um, there was a very interesting paper a couple years ago in... Um I could, if you're interested, I could, I could dig it up, probably have it with me, um, in the, the scientific literature that um, looked at this question of, of, um, of recovery of the Arctic. That is, um, the trajectory we're on, um, the estimates, um, you know, are all over the place, but just in the last couple of years now, since 2007, the projections for a summer ice-free Arctic um, have become closer in time than, than further in time. So I was part of a major assessment of Arctic climate. We published a report in 2005, and at that point, it looked like the latter half of this century. That was 2005. Then we had 2007. Now we have uh, 2012 data. And there are projections now that are looking you know, up more like 20, 20, 20, 30 in that period. But, but what this, this modeling study showed was that if you stabilize atmospheric CO2 concentrations, um, the, the Arctic would respond rather, rather quickly. Um, so when we worry about these, these uh, points of, uh, you know, where the equilibrium shifts and it changes to another state, um, the question being, could you, at anything like today's atmospheric CO2 concentrations, recover ice in the Arctic? And their argument was... Yeah, you wouldn't have to wait a thousand years until, until the sort of natural dissipation of the CO2 into the system. But uh, back to that larger question. I mean, I think uh, this is always a, a very tricky. Um, I mean, I think it's uh, scientists need to talk about the data as they see them. Um, but there are times when I take that hat off. Like um, a month ago, I was testifying before the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works about what we know about changes in climate from understanding the ocean and, and the questions from part of the senators, some of the senators in the room, some of them don't want to hear about this, but some of them who do are, well, what should we be doing or what could we do to make a difference? And, and this is where a, um, any sort of, of effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions buys us time and, and ultimately if it's, if it's sufficiently effective globally, would stabilize this problem. And we've had ups and downs in all of this. Um, we, um, we had a period four years ago when we had two candidates for the presidency who both argued that if they were elected, they would work hard to, to uh, develop U.S. policies that would reduce our emissions of fossil fuel um, CO2 and, and, well, their agricultural losses as well. In fact, uh, the leader in the U.S. Senate for the previous uh, seven or eight years on this subject was Senator John McCain. He was more active and more aggressive than any other senator in, 
in formulating and, and working on bipartisan resolutions, uh, formulating resolutions, working on bipartisan support in this area. Um, it has become since then so amazingly partisan that it's, uh, it's just, I mean, it's mind boggling. Um, but I must say the, the testimony that I gave in early August, the most extreme uh, voice arguing there is nothing to worry about and CO2 is good for us is the Oklahoma Senator James Inhofe. The committee I, I was testifying before, he's the ranking um, minority member. There were three other Republican senators, Senator Sessions from Alabama, Senator Crapo from Idaho, and Senator Boozman from Arkansas. Senator Crapo did not ask any questions, but both Senator Sessions and Senator Boozman distanced themselves from Senator Inhofe's position. They both said, I think the earth is warming. I think humans have something to do with it. But, but we don't know how to deal with that, and we've got to somehow get the conversation going rather than shouting. So uh, privately or even semi-publicly, but now when it comes to voting on something, that becomes a different issue with uh, party partisan positioning. Um, but, um, you know, the students on campus did a uh, piece that came out a week ago about uh, Massachusetts politicians who uh, are running for office, uh, national office, and looked at their records on this, looked at whether they map or not onto the, uh, the publications of the faculty of their alma maters. <laughs> um, had a little splash of that. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. a week ago last Friday, or excuse me, in New York City. Um, we, uh, I had actually written to um, Rupert Murdoch uh, asking to meet with him and talk about the misrepresentation in Fox News, which is uh, basically 95% misleading in climate science, mm -hmm. and the editorial uh, page of the Wall Street Journal, which is about 85% misleading. Um, and interestingly, Mr. Murdoch has personally said that he accepts climate science as, as arguing consistently that Earth's climate is changing and that humans have something to do with it. And he has said that, that his news organizations are going to move towards climate neutrality and actually has done things along his line. So my question to him is, how are these two news organizations, Fox News is the most widely watched cable news service in the United States. Um, and there are some people who only get news from Fox News. How how can he reconcile this inconsistency? He hasn't answered my letter, but we decided to go to New York and do a little um, public event on this at the New York Public Library. I uh, got some press attention from it. but So, yeah, I mean, I think all of us uh, who have an understanding of how this system is changing have to decide how to use that uh, knowledge and, and voice um, in the most effective way we can. I would just add, I guess, close by saying that it's also interesting that the senators say, you know, I get mail on guns, I get mail on drugs, I get mail on abortion, I get mail on war, but I don't get much mail on this. So they, they don't see their constituents as being all that exercised about it. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. You're welcome.